Hey everyone, welcome back to Stack Tracker. In the last video, we explored the difference between query parameters and path parameters. If you missed that tutorial, you can check it out by clicking the link in the top right corner. Today, we're diving into API testing in Postman. We'll look at how to structure requests, test different endpoints, and understand the responses all within Postman. Whether you're new to API testing or just looking to sharpen your skills, this video is for you. Let's dive in. For this tutorial, I'll be using a free API server. You can see the link on your screen right now, and I'll also include it in the description of this video so you can follow along easily. Let's head over to the API documentation and see what kind of operations we can test. Let's start with testing adding an object. We'll begin by copying the endpoint URL and then switch over to Postman. First, we need to create a collection. Collections help us organize requests logically, and as you'll see later, we can also share data like variables between the requests in a collection. Uh, by the way, if you're not familiar with Postman collections or want to refresh your skills, I've got a dedicated tutorial just for that. You can check out the link in the top right corner. All right, let's go ahead and create a new collection. Give it a clear name that represents the API you're testing. Since we'll be sending multiple requests and they all share the same base URL, it's a good idea to define this as a collection variable. That way we only need to set it once and we can reuse it across all our requests using the variable syntax. It keeps things clean, efficient, and makes future updates easier, especially if the base URL changes. Once you've added the variable, don't forget to save the collection. Postman doesn't autosave, so get into the habit of clicking that save button regularly. Okay, now let's create a request to add a new object. Since we're gonna add something, we need to use the post method. Give the request a clear and meaningful name and enter the correct URL. Since we already defined the base URL as a collection variable, we only need to extend it with a specific path for this endpoint. In the body of the request, we'll use the JSON structure provided in the API documentation. You can copy it directly from there but make sure to change at least one field, for example, the title, so we can easily recognize the object we created later. Once that's done, go ahead and click the Send button. In the response, you'll see the newly created object along with its unique ID. It's important to keep track of this ID because we'll need it later, for example, to retrieve, update, or delete this specific object. To make things more efficient, we can automate the process of storing this ID using a script. Postman lets us write test scripts that run right after a request is completed. So let's switch to the Scripts tab and add a short script that grabs the ID from the response and saves it as a collection variable. This way we don't have to copy and paste it manually every time we need it. It's a simple trick, but really powerful, especially when you're working with dynamic data or building a multi-step workflow. All right, so let me explain what's going on here. First, PM stands for Postman. It's a built-in object that gives us access to everything inside Postman scripts. That includes the request, response, environment and collection variables, and even the test functions. Now, PM.response refers specifically to the response we got back from the API call. And JSON is a method that converts the response body into a JavaScript object, assuming the response is in JSON format, which is very common for APIs. We store that object in a variable called JSON data, so we can easily access values like ID, title, and so on. Now we want to get the object ID from our JSON object and assign it to a variable so we can use it in our request. To do it, we type PM, and that gives us access to Postman's scripting features. Then collection variables, this lets us work with variables at the collection level. Then we use set to save a new variable. Inside, we first put the name, object ID, that's the variable. We will use it later in other requests, and the value JSON data.id, which we got from the response. And now the ID is saved and ready to use in our next request. Now press send. Take note of the ID in the response. Then let's check what changes. Go to the collection variables and you'll see a new variable named object ID. Its value matches the ID from the response. Each time you execute this request, the object ID will be updated with a new ID. Let's retrieve the newly created object. To do this, we create a new request within our collection. 
This time we need to use the get method to fetch the object. According to the documentation, we need to provide the object's ID in the URL. Since we already have a collection variable storing this ID, let's make use of it by referencing object ID in the request URL. To verify that everything is set up correctly, click the send button. As we can see, we receive a response and the name in the response matches exactly what we set earlier. Everything is great so far, but what about testing? Let's test something. First, we want to check whether the response status code is 200 OK. To do this, go back to the Tests tab in your request. Start by writing a comment. This is optional, but I highly recommend it. Adding comments makes your tests easier to understand later, especially if you come back to them after some time. As I mentioned earlier, everything in the script starts with the PM object, which is part of the Postman API. Now we want to use the pm.test function to write our test. The first parameter for this function is a text string that appears in the test result output. Use this to identify your tests and communicate the purpose of a test to anyone viewing the results. Then inside the function, we write the logic that actually performs the check. What we're doing here is telling Postman to look at the response from our request and verify that the status code is 200. This helps us confirm that everything is working as expected and the request was successful. Now let's check whether the ID is present in the response body. Inside the function, we use an assertion to check if the response body contains a property called ID. This is useful when we expect the server to return an ID after creating or fetching an object. By running this test, we can make sure that the response actually includes the ID field, which confirms that the request worked correctly and returned the expected data. Now, let's run the request again. Take a look at the Test Results tab. You'll see something like 2 of 2, which means both of our tests have passed. If we expand the section, we can see the names of our two tests, and each one has a passed status next to it. Now let's try something interesting. We'll intentionally change the request URL to something incorrect. This simulates a scenario where the server returns an unexpected response, uh, maybe a 404 error or something else. After sending the request with the wrong URL, we can see that both of our tests have failed. This tells us that our tests are working correctly, if the API doesn't behave as expected, the tests will catch it. So we wrote a test to check the add object request. Now let's create a test for the get object request. We'll start by adding a status code check, just like we did earlier. Then we want to verify that the response contains the correct ID the same one we created earlier and stored in the collection variable. I almost forgot. We need to make sure we've parsed the response body into a variable like JSON data. You already know how to do this, so we'll go through it quickly. Now let me explain what's happening here. We access the ID from the response body and compare it to the object ID stored in the collection variable. If both values are equal, the test passes. This confirms that the object we fetched is exactly the one we previously created. This kind of test helps ensure consistency and accuracy when retrieving data through the API. Now, when it comes to testing, it's very important to bring the system back to its original state after the test is complete. In our case, we created an object specifically for testing purposes, so at the end, we should delete it. Let's create a delete request and see what happens when we execute it. This step ensures that our test data doesn't accumulate over time and that each test run starts with a clean, predictable state. It also helps keep the environment consistent and prevents unwanted side effects from leftover test data. Since we need to specify the ID of the object we want to delete, we can simply copy the URL from the GET request. All we need to do is change the HTTP method to delete. If we successfully delete the object, we'll see a response message that includes the ID of the deleted object. Now let's create a test for this request. 
Just like before, we'll use the test function to write our logic. Inside the test, we want to check whether the ID provided in the response matches the one we stored in the collection variable. In this case, the response is a message inside a JSON object. So we'll construct the expected string manually using the stored ID and then compare it with the actual response text to see if they match. This allows us to confirm that the correct object was deleted and that the API is returning the expected confirmation message. Now let's go through the complete flow. We start by creating a new object and keeping track of the newly generated ID. Next, we run the delete request. In the URL, we can see that our ID is correctly passed. After executing the request, we see the same ID returned in the response message. Plus, our test passes. Everything looks good. Now let's try something else. We've already deleted the object with this ID. But what happens if we try to delete it again? As expected, the object no longer exists, so the server responds with a 404 not found status. Also, our test fails, because the response message no longer matches what we expected when the object existed. This shows that our tests are not only confirming success, but also are catching errors when something unexpected happens. Uh, you did very well. Everything is working fine. But running each test manually, one by one, isn't something you want to do every day. Right now, we only have three requests, but imagine having 20 or even 50. Manually executing each one would be time-consuming and inefficient. That's where Postman's Collection Runner comes in. It allows us to run all the tests in a collection automatically. To use it, navigate to the Collection menu and click on Run Collection. Uh, this opens a special window where you can choose which requests you want to include in the test run. You can disable any requests you don't want to run, and you can also change the execution order. In our case, we need to run the requests in this specific order, create the object, then read it, and finally delete it. Once everything is set, go ahead and start the run. As a result, you'll see the test results for each request you selected. In our case, all tests should be marked as passed. Postman also offers the ability to schedule test runs. You can configure a specific time and day for the tests to run automatically. Uh, this is especially useful for monitoring APIs or running regular health checks without manual intervention. Great! In this tutorial, we validated API responses by writing meaningful tests to ensure our requests return the expected results. We use dynamic variables to make our tests flexible and reusable across different requests. And finally, we automated test runs using Postman's Collection Runner to streamline the entire testing process. This foundation will help you, you build efficient, scalable, and maintainable tests for any API project. So I hope this was interesting. Thank you for watching my tutorials. If you enjoyed this, please like the video and subscribe. See you later. Bye.